That's okay. <laughs> okay, we are live. So welcome everybody to our monthly book club discussion. And with me today are our book club members, uh, James, Shay, and Agatha. Welcome guys. Hello. Thank you for having us. Yeah. Hi. Thanks for being here. So we are going to be discussing the book, uh, Complex PTSD by Pete Walker. Um, and I guess, Agatha, do you want to go ahead and open with what you were talking about? Yeah. About the book? So, okay. oh, 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 wait, actually, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I knew I was forgetting something, but I couldn't remember what. Uh, so real quick, these book clubs are sponsored by Audible. So if you are interested in getting a free audiobook, you can get one if you sign up by going to audibletrial.com slash thrive after abuse. Audible has hundreds of thousands of audiobooks. It's the largest audiobook provider currently on the internet. So again, if you're interested in a free audiobook, audi audibletrial.com slash thrive after abuse. Okay, Agatha, take it away. So I love Audible, by the way. <laughs> so this is perfect. Um, mine, I guess this is to encourage people who are really terrified of this book because you know usually i heard about this book before and everyone was telling me always how triggering this book is because it addresses all the different aspects of what we struggle with you know flashback the whole complex post-traumatic stress disorder and i want to calm your mind because the book has book is made of short very specific chapters so if you're not ready to deal with everything about your complex post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, you can literally open the book, go through the content and just pick, I don't know, the inner critic or 4F responses or whatever you think that will actually make the biggest difference for you right now. And this way you can be totally in charge of you know, your recovery process, your healing, get your own tempo. And, um, the, why this is important, I think, is because he actually addresses this in one of the uh, chapters that there is the thing called bibliotherapy, which is really awesome because if you are not ready to go to the therapist or if you have a trouble to you know, work with the therapist um, right now, uh, you can use books to really start your own therapy and to get yourself uh, better and good enough to actually be able to work in a relationship with the therapist. And I think that the way he designed this book is absolutely freaking loosely brilliant for, you know, just for that, from that side. It's, it's amazing. Yeah. And you're, <laughs> you're also less likely to get overwhelmed by trying to take in the whole entire book in one, you know, one go around this way you can read a couple of few chapters and then digest it and then go back later on. And Small again, bites of the elephant. Yeah. Yes, yeah. thank you. I love when people say that because mm -hmm. complex PTSD is just huge. And, you know, everyone's just looking at it and everyone gets overwhelmed. Like, what am I going to do? I'm just going to go crazy, right? Yep. For the rest of my life. And here now, there are so those small solutions. You know, you can read the chapter. But what I really want to encourage you guys, like, you know, everyone that listened to it, please, if you have it in you, if you read it, try to do the work you don't have to do it exactly how it says even if you do it like whatever but like you do something it will benefit you largely and that's what's gonna make a difference you can read a bunch of books just reading's not gonna make a difference applying those things that makes difference mm -hmm. so that's, that's I'm guilty my of that too i read like 10 books after this card and then you're reading them all but you're not really um like applying it so it it gets kind of built up when you get stuck. So. Yeah. And in the beginning, if you need to read for a while and just gain better understanding before you start applying, that's okay too. Yeah. But just realize that at some point when you do feel ready to start applying little pieces where you can, and it doesn't have to be a lot at once, just like, like Agatha said, taking those smaller chunks of chapters and, and just picking something that you feel more comfortable working on first and start there and, and it, it will lead to a lot of good things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of the things I, uh, I have, well, actually real quick for 
people that are on the chat or that are listening or watching this later, my book club notes for this, um, you can find them over at thriveafterabuse.com under the tab book club. Uh, there's a drop down menu that says book club notes. And I have my top eight uh, takeaways from, from this book. One of the things uh, I noticed in this book is he really only, if I remember correctly, only talks about CPTSD in terms of childhood abuse and how it's developed in childhood and happens later on in life. But it's my understanding that CPTSD can be developed at any time. So yeah, what, do you, what do you guys think? Um, I kind of agree with him in a, in a way that I think that uh, most of my comp you know, CPTSD comes from my childhood and then it was really further reinforced by all the toxic relationship that I entangle in. And I also think that this is why I get entangled because like, you know, ha having, not being physically abused in your childhood doesn't mean that you are cared for and nourished and right. you are a great functioning person and you don't have a complex PTSD. Mm. Like, you, you know, like, I think that's what he really addresses there that it's, it's something that people don't even realize they have it because they don't have the specific like abuse that they can relate to. Like if they would need to describe what had happened to them, they would be like, well, nothing really happened. But that, you know, when they say that it's like, well, my mother wasn't really my mother, right? Or my father wasn't really my mother. I was basically like the lost child. So, yeah. you know, it's, it's hard, but I, I do, I do think that it's major, probably major of the cases, it is from childhood. I, I would... think a lot more of it does originate at least partly in childhood. That's true for me. It, it got much worse at a certain point from a later relationship, for sure. Um, I mean, there's no way to say what would happen without that history. I, I can't know that, but I'm, I'm inclined to agree with what you said. Yeah, Definitely. same here. And I, I think it's a familiar, familiar thing because you, you know, it's what you're used to from childhood. So it plus it's a lot compounds. harder to know what you missed out on that wasn't there trying to identify that. Yeah. Versus looking at what you think abuse is. I think, I think most people missed out on at least a few things that, that caused some, something somewhere that they would benefit from working on. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't have to be this thing you described as abuse to cause something that you can benefit from reading this book. I agree. I think, you know, Pia Melody talks about it in terms of a less than nurturing home environment. And I really have yet to meet anybody that's come from an appropriately nurturing environment that were parents. I mean, giving that love and that nourishment and attention is, is wonderful and it's important, but also helping a child to understand how to keep themselves safe. Pete Walker talks about this in his book. I have it in my notes somewhere about the kind of quote unquote, good enough parenting. And that involves, you know, teaching a child how to be self-protective through, you know, boundary standards, deal breakers, teaching a child about real world danger and, you know, um, basically how to stay safe and how to interact with the world and how to understand themselves, how to understand their body, how to understand their emotions, um, all of this stuff. But again, I've yet to ever come across, I feel like a lot of people, you know, um, myself included, you know, we're all walking around with some of the pieces of the puzzle. And then it takes these painful experiences for us to realize, oh, wow. Okay. Actually. Yeah. These are some of the other pieces that I'm missing. And, you know, we start putting these pieces together when, you know, down the road, when our thirties, forties, fifties and onward. So I, I think there is a case that you can, you know, even let's say you had great parents and you know, you, you were, you were nourished by your parents. Cause I think I know people who actually were, which I actually meet more and more of those people right now, which is awesome. Uh, but so let's say you had that and then you still can, you know, fall, um, let's say, you can fall a victim of uh, sex trafficking and that will give you a complex post-traumatic stress disorder. So there, so basically any, any kind of abuse and it doesn't matter what time of your life it will happen, but if it's unescapable, prolonged, severe, and um, I don't know what else is you know required there, but that will lead to the complex post-traumatic stress disorder. And the reason why it's complex is because not one time event is prolonged. So like, my therapists work with uh, sex trafficking victims and 
each that's why he's so great with me because each of those people had complex post-traumatic stress disorder he doesn't work with them about the child hormones he works with them about what happened when they were trafficked and imprisoned and sold into slavery so yeah and there's a question here in the chat from dandelion greens who says would you say the childhood cptsd leads to adult cptsd the adult version is unlikely to happen without the child version question mark um I was just thinking the same thing. Like, I wonder if there's been a study on that. My guess is that it could yeah. still happen. I mean, if, if you had somebody who was raised in, in an incredibly nourishing environment and you threw that person in a POW camp, I'm pretty sure they would have some CPTSD by the end of it to deal with. So I, I don't think that a childhood thing is a prerequisite, but I, but I think that just the way culture is now, even if your parents are pretty good, most, most, most of the way across the board, there's a lot of trauma in childhood, just, you know, the way the way kids treat each other and school environments and playgrounds and all the different people that come and go through through a kid's life. I think everybody encounters at least some things that are you might not describe to yourself as rising to the level of trauma, but can still trigger little pockets of this that if you later encountered something bigger it would magnify that where it might not have been a problem otherwise really if that makes sense Mm -hmm. yeah it does well i think like with agatha's description of um you know uh, people getting sex trafficked like they can you can have a great home life and then if something horrific happens to you like that you're most likely going to have cptsd from it so child and I, i would also say childhood cptsd the first part of the question, does childhood CPTSD lead to adult CPTSD? Um, I would, I think more often than not, what it is, is childhood CPTSD goes unresolved. So if it's unhealed, it's carried into adulthood, Mm -hmm. but it doesn't necessarily like, and because it's unresolved, like a big part of healing from this, or I should say a big problem with childhood CPTSD is you lack that core sense of self is is ineffectively developed. Then until that imbalance is corrected, it's gonna lead to basically a series of um, vulnerabilities that are gonna lead to poor decision-making and kind of this inability to uh, have a healthy level of discernment about other people. Cause we're just, we're, act, we're reacting with the world through our defenses and not through a healthy place of being grounded in ourself, I guess. I would agree with that. And the other part is it's, it's kind of hidden unless it's, you know, blatantly somebody has a flashback to where it just completely mm-hmm. freezes them. So it's not like people, kids walk around with like a sign above their head that says like, Hey, I have steep, unless a teacher or, you know, a guardian or whoever knows what to look for, they're not going to be very likely to say, Hey, they may need to go to counseling and check out you know what's going on with them so i don't think any i'm sorry james i don't think anyone looks at the child and say oh they have complex post-traumatic stress disorder they just look at the child they think oh this child is problematic there is something Mm -hmm. wrong with this child they have behavioral issues stuff like that and um you know that's unfortunate right now like it's you know it's it's still a this conversation if it's recognized or not recognized should it be in a, like i love this point in the book when the guy i don't remember who said that but he said that if complex post-traumatic stress disorder was actually in the dsm the new dsm the dsm from being a big and you know big volume would be like little booklet and yeah. i'm like yep i believe that <laughs> Seriously. i do too and then the the just to like i i don't think there is a distinction like a childhood cptsd and then adult cptsd i kind of think once you have it as a child like especially if you develop it like at the very very early age i almost feel like it just goes with you through every age you are and i i almost have a problem to to say that you have another cptsd i think you are someone who has cptsd and you have a very poor chances of actually acting like an adult because you are surviving, you are uh, reacting from the four Fs, you know, you know, just to protect yourself all the time. And there is like one of the things when you are recovering from, you know, from CPTSD is you find out that how immature you are, like you never really matured. You never really embrace being an adult like, like you would Very if you didn't have CPTSD as a child. Yeah. 
So for me, it's like hard to even look at that, to be honest with you. Like, mm-hmm. it was yeah, we, we end up developing a lot of defense tactics that work for a while. I mean, when, when we're children, they're, they're helpful. They help us even through adolescence and maybe even into young adulthood. They can still work well enough that Mm -hmm. the problem doesn't become big enough where we have to change that strategy and really look at that stuff. And that that's where when you end up in one of these kind of horrific relationships that sends you into a tailspin on the floor, and then you realize, Oh, this strategy does not work anymore. Mm -hmm. And that's when a lot of resolution can come out of that, that, that shift from things having worked for a while and then no longer working. I I think that that's probably pretty common. And here's a question from Dandelion Greens again, who says, so would sex trafficking and being a prisoner of war be more PTSD or more blatant trauma? I'm just trying to understand the differences and what CPTSD is. Let me read to you what Pete Walker writes about what exactly CPTSD is. Um, He describes it as a more severe form of PTSD. It's caused by abuse and or neglect. Um, In childhood, these are kind of my words here, in childhood, uh, if a child is able to go to a parent and express their feelings, then they can grieve and the child, then the parent can protect the child. So he describes it in terms of childhood only, but like we were saying, I really feel that if this is just prolonged abuse in general, prolonged abuse or neglect. Anyways, so if a child experiences some sort of trauma, uh, normally they'd be able to go and grieve and the parent can protect the child. However, in PTSD inducing homes, the child is somehow traumatized and then they're unable to feel, to go back to feeling safe and secure. So they stay in the, the fight or flight mode. And the results of that are there's key developmental arrests, which include a diminishment or absence of self-compassion, self-acceptance, clear identity, the ability to be self-protective, the ability to relax, the ability to draw comfort from a relationship, full self-expression, loss of willpower and motivation, peace of mind, self-care, belief that life is a gift, self-esteem, and self-confidence. Anger and resentment can turn inward instead of being placed on parents. And recovery involves unwinding yourself. Uh, CPTSD is often misdiagnosed as bipolar, codependence, autism, borderline personality disorder, um, narcissism, ADHD, obsessive disorder, depression, anxiety. Um, Although CPTSD can co-occur with these different diagnoses. Um, He said to simply reduce CPTSD to a panic disorder is akin to reducing food allergies to just saying it's chronically itchy eyes. So, yeah. Whereas PTSD tends to be, PTSD tends to be, it's a traumatic incident. Um, You're in a terrible car accident. Uh, You see somebody get shot. You have a house fire, something like this, that. And here's the thing too, is not, every trauma leads to CPTSD or or PTSD. It's only about 15 or 20% of people that can, that experience this. The the symptoms of CPTSD or PTSD um, are pretty common after any type of trauma, whether it's like long lasting emotional or whether it's short-term, a short-term experience. It's kind of how long those symptoms last. And like Agatha was saying, in childhood, when these kinds of things happen to a person, you know, we're shaped. It really kind of thought the first seven years of our life is really what sets our personality. And so when a child's roadmap to understanding how to have relationships, how to understand themselves, who they are, um, kind of how to get along with others, all, I mean, we're basically talking about skills that kids have down by first grade. These are the the foundational skills. When we talk about, for example, like we talk about narcissism and it's sort of like having to teach an adult, hey, it's not okay to spit and hit and cuss and yell and do all these things. There's something profoundly wrong there because they should have mastered this by the age of seven. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's different developmental arrests um, that occur. But I, I love how he says, um, he looks at the whole thing as 
it's a learned response to stress. Mm -hmm. So that's what, you know, should give everyone in the chat room and listening to it lots of hope. Because yes. it's, it's something you learn. And you learn how to cope. Yeah, you learn how to cope. So Survive. just those responses are so many times reinforced that it's like automatic for you. But, you know, if you really go back to the source, you learn it. And what it means is that there's, you have an ability to unlearn it. And, you know, it's, it's, it will be harder because you are older now. So your brain, you know, doesn't have the same flexibility as a child because as a child, you did something one time and you're like, mm -hmm. got it. You go for it like, bam, each time. Now as an adult, it will take an effort for you to develop those new habits, create new patterns. It will be work, like W-O-R-K, <laughs> but it's possible. You can do it. And I think that's, that's, the, that's the biggest part about it, you know, from this book. That's I agree. I feel like that gives a lot of hope. And we were all discussing the book ahead of time before we went live and kind of the different aha moments that we had. And um, it, it just brings so much. It's so, you know, it's, it's, it can be difficult to heal if we don't know what to work on. And right. this book was so helpful for, at least for me, I think for a lot of people, because you realize, oh my gosh, these are the different defenses that I was using to kind of navigate through life. And now I see how this was problematic and how I need to get some more balance um, kind of, you know, in, in different ways. It was just very eye-opening because once you know better or once you know different, then you can do different. It can make a big difference if, if you go through periods where you're just feeling generally defective to realize that these are learned things that you can actually consciously choose to chip away at and you can learn and grow and it's not about being defective it's just a missing skill set and you can develop that you i mean totally you can and the vast majority of people really do have some part of this skill set that's missing like i said i've yet to come across somebody where i just thought boy they have it all figured out and the, actually the people that i have actually th that i have thought that of are the ones that have done a tremendous amount of reading and learning and discussing they're really dedicated to personal growth i i've yet to come across a person who's just you know naturally picked out of the cabbage patch yeah. and has all this stuff figured out so yeah. when you say wisdom it came with a cost of tuition <laughs> right <laughs> just did. tuition at the school of hard knocks <laughs> yeah. no but that's so true sure. it's, it's it's the same when you go to the gym and you so, see some of this beautiful body you want to have it but you don't want to do the work right so yes. it's like it only comes with the cost of that work. Now, I want to address something in the chat because I think this is one of the really important things is that people are being misdiagnosed when they have, you know, CP, CPTSD. We are being diagnosed with bipolar, Asperger. You know, we, we are told all those different labels, uh, borderline personality disorder. And, you know, when you are being told, you know, all the different um diagnosis from all the different doctors at the end you end up just feeling crazy you don't know what to do and you basically like feel resigned hope you just feel like you are damaged you feel defective and yeah. you feel worse yeah. than before <laughs> yeah so i i you know here's the thing i i lived through that i was misdiagnosed i was even misdiagnosed with that what is it the dissociative personality disorder i'm like yeah no i don't have that like i had enough you know mind in me to say no definitely this is ridiculous but i wish i read this book like 10 years ago yeah. or eight years ago and i don't know i cannot like i read this book in a hindsight because basically most of the things that he suggests there to do i've done it in like from different sources and that's why i think this book is great because you have it all together it's like but a I, reference book for yeah you. but i wish um, i've read it before i don't know how much i will get in the first reading because you know you you really you know your brain is not working like your cognitive whatever you know mm -hmm. when, especially mm -hmm. after just being abused as psychologically abused you're not able to comprehend everything that's in this book but oh my god how much i wish i read this book then like, yeah yeah well let's talk about um we'll clarify for people listening that let me go over the five features of CPTSD and then we'll go into the, he calls it the four Fs, which are human defense mechanisms. Actually, yeah. I'm laughing. Mammal. The four Fs always goes in my head. Yeah. 
<laughs> okay, so five features of CPTSD. We have emotional flashbacks, toxic shame, self-abandonment, inner and outer critic, and then chronic anxiety. And emotional flashbacks can be sudden and prolonged, um, including overwhelming fear, shame, rage, depression. It's an unnecessary triggering of, of our fight or flight mechanism, and they can range in intensity and duration. Probably the, one of the best ways to tell if you're experiencing an emotional flashback is if you find yourself having a reaction that's disproportionate to the event at hand. Um, you have to, Angie and I were talking about this earlier on the live stream we did, um, having to confront somebody or having to tell somebody no, or, um, I mean, it could be any little thing, it, you know, ha you name it. I mean, you name it. It could be any little thing, but if you find yourself, you're crying, you're upset, you're angry, uh, you know, somebody looks at you the wrong way, a coworker says something and it just, it triggers something that can be generally as a sign of an emotional flashback, which is, um, kind of our brain's way of saying, Hey, there's a message here for you. There's some unresolved pain that you need to examine and, and process. Yeah. Um, okay, so the toxic shame is feeling deeply flawed and unlovable. So it's that feeling that there's something just profoundly wrong with us. Self-abandonment is loss of boundaries, standards, and deal breakers. It's people-pleasing behavior, and it's not knowing what we think or feel, and it's perpetual self-doubt. Uh, the inner and outer critic. I like how he differentiates this. Um, I've never heard that before. Oh, I didn't. I have a major typo in my notes here. The inner critic bullies and shames us and points out every flaw, whereas the outer critic notices every flaw in other people. And the reason that that outer critic exists is basically it's a kind of a defensive way for us to stay safe. So it's sort of like other people can't be trusted and unless they're perfect, then I can't stay no. safe kind of a thing. And then the last one is chronic anxiety, which is due to chronically being in fight or flight mode as a result of feeling defensive or unworthy. Do you guys have anything to add to that? My guess is that, that most people who would be watching something like this or reading a book like this probably have on balance a lot more inner critic than outer critic. I mean, that's not a black and white thing. But I think part of what makes us self-reflective enough to even take this on is the willingness to own more than we should instead of putting it all, you know, that external locus of control. Yeah. When, when somebody goes too far to the outer critic end, they're a lot less likely to be looking inside for this stuff. This is just my opinion. He didn't say this in the book. Mm -hmm. so. In the previous book. Remember the internalizer? Yeah. Internalizer. I was, yeah, I saw the collection too. It was great. I think the um, outer critic tends to surface once a person gets re in tune with their anger. Yeah. And they start learning about setting boundaries and saying no and asserting themselves. I, 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 and I think, frankly, it's a normal, probably natural stage in healing. It's kind of getting your sea legs because I, I see a lot of survivors, again, myself included, where when they start learning about kind of the differences between um, kind of, uh, you know, functional relationships and dysfunctional relationships, they're, they can get locked into this all or nothing thinking mm -hmm. of this person has to be, PM Melody talked about this. I forget which book it was. It was their facing codependence or facing love addiction where this other person basically has to be completely perfect or um, we panic and run. But a lot of that has, that stems from, we're still learning how to set boundaries and how to be assertive and how to have deal breakers. So I think that's where that all or nothing is coming from. Cause it's like, I need you to be this healthy, well-adjusted person because th the only way I know how to handle it is to just bolt if, if you're not. And yeah. Once you develop enough self-trust, which, which comes through just practicing this mm -hmm. stuff. I mean, it does develop, but once, once you achieve that kind of trust in yourself to perceive things and to process things and to work on things you want to work on that, 
there, there's not a real problem with outer critic. It's more, you might observe, okay, this is a thing I see happening. Do I want to mess with that or not? It's, it, but it's not really about judging the other person. It becomes more about what you want your choices to be in that situation. And it, right. it's, it, it's, it's something that when you make that shift, you just sort of notice the difference. But I think that hypervigilance there's a period of hypervigilance where you really need to keep yourself safe because you're still really just beat up and raw and you, you just cannot go near a situation like that again because you know you're you're too raw to consider it and it's natural to put up a lot of defenses and to yeah. be that that's not the same thing as as being critical of people that that's a temporary self-protection that I think people really need for a time until they have healed enough to be ready to deal with that so mm -hmm. if you find yourself being critical that way while you are hyper vigilant I, I would not go back to the inner critic and start bashing the hell out of yourself because you're doing that it's it's, it's a process yeah i don't i think and my understanding of the other critic was different here i think you more address the people who have the fight responses from the you know cptsd because they will be always criticizing everything out there and what we were just talking about, I, I look at it in a different way. I think this is like a first level of getting validated. When we start putting things together and we understand what's functional, what's healthy, what's not. And the first, like a first level of validating yourself, your own experience is seeing what's not working. So we just like, oh my gosh, those people are crazy. I saw this and I can't believe this woman talked like this to the child. Now I know this is wrong, but we're not doing it in a way to like criticize it. We just like, we literally just getting a hold of the reality and we validate validating like our position, our stand in that reality. And then once we kind of like get used to that new norm, because mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a new norm, it goes away. And then we, we, we don't do that. Then we learn how to self validate. So I, I wouldn't call that outer critic at all. I because tend I to agree they, with you. Yeah, I think it's more a process of relearning how to interpret the whole yeah. world around you because your whole paradigm for understanding everything has just like totally changed. Yeah, because yeah. inner critic is based in a super ego. What we were just describing, that's not from the super ego at all. Right. Yeah, this is from the just me, my identity, my ego, learn, learning what's my reality right now. That's yeah. I, think I, I think people can, people with a strong inner critic can mistake trying to understand things around them as an outer critic that it's not. So really what you just said is a better way to unpack what it was I was trying to sort of get at. Thank you. But yeah, <laughs> I think it's a little bit of both because like I said, I, I see this time and time and time again where you're right. Like initially when people start to wake up to realizing, oh my gosh, I have been glossing over everything bad in others and only focusing on the good. So they're, they're coming from this, like what he will, we'll get to this in a second, but like the fawn defense. Um, and then when they get re in tune with that anger, which is that fight defense, they can frequently kind of switch to the other side. And I see this a lot where people are like, I'm so scared. Is narcissism contagious? Did I become a narcissist? Am I the narcissist? I'm so angry. And I am so, um, you know, just have this ax to grind and I'm fault finding. It's hard. That's the, the tightrope. That's the challenge, right? It's sort of like, okay, well, like what, what is excessive fault finding? And then what is actually noticing legitimate problematic behavior and being discerning? And it's all of this stuff. It's, it's can be so difficult to, to sort out as you're going through as you're going through it. So those are really great points that you guys bring up about this. Um, let's, let's hop into the four F's so people kind of know uh, what we're talking about here. Yes. This is, this is so cool. Like, yes. Was this a game changer for you guys? Cause it was from, yes. No, because no. I read it before, like I read the four F's so many else's before. I'm serious. I wish I read this book like years ago. That would be a game changer then. Yeah. Yeah. But it was great. You know, it was very validating for me. Very. Well, good. Yeah. So he talks about it. So we, as human beings, we have different defense mechanisms and our 
physiological ones are fight, flight, freeze. And then he mentions a fourth one, which he calls fawn. So fawn in terms of kind of, you know, fawning over somebody, kind of this ingratiating, overly kind. Super people pleasing. Super people pleasing kind of behavior. So I refer to it as friend, just, but we'll go with fawn since it's his, his book. Um, but anyways, so he says, if a person has good enough parenting, then they'll be able to shift in and out of these various four F types when necessary. If not, then they are locked into one primary type, which dictates how they react to stressful people in situations. So we, we all have a primary type. And then he mentions a little bit later, a secondary type. And uh, so the fight type is assertiveness, anger, and aggression. And he mentions, you know, when this defense is in balance, it becomes assertiveness, boundaries, leadership, and courage. When this defense is out of balance, when a person's too locked into this fight, it becomes controlling, entitlement, narcissism, like pathological narcissism, perfectionism, sociopathic behavior, um, scapegoating and blaming everyone else, kind of a thing. It's never their fault. It's everybody else. How people with the fight defense connect to others is that they use control. So they only connect with others to control them. And in order to feel safe, they use rage. So it's sort of like, I can only, if I have a fight defense going on, I would need somebody, here's the box that I think that you need to be in. If you step out of this box, I'm going to rage at you until you get back in the box. And the only way that I can actually connect with you is if you are in the box. So that's pathological narcissism. And that's a problem because then it erodes that other person's, you know, identity and sense of self. Uh, Let's see. Mm -hmm. What's, You know, what can be a little bit confusing to some of people that listen to it is that he, you know, we addressing here that not people with narcissistic personality disorder are people with their fight response and a fight response, you know, if it's only fight response, that means that they kind of have complex post-traumatic stress disorder. And, you know, it it may be a little bit hard thing to, to look at. Because, you know, we usually look at, oh, people with complex post-traumatic stress disorder is just us, you know, the victims. But um, here, is, here is how I, I, will, re- I will read actually the, the chapters when he addresses, you know, how he works with people with narcissistic personality disorder and he works on their complex post-traumatic stress disorder. And um, I, I, I think I heard what he, was, what he meant is that those are two issues that they can be together. So he never addresses narcissism as something that he can treat or heal and work people on. But what he can work on is that fight response and that CPTSD over there. A lot of what you see is a a fight fawn, which is sort of equates to that sweet mean cycle. Yeah. Yeah. But, but just because, you know, I was reading this book and I was like, oh my God, if someone reads it and they will think that, yay, I'm just going to send my narcissist to the therapist because they have (laughs) no, (laughs) no, 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 don't do that. (laughs) Because, you know, he, he, he never in this book addresses really, you know, therapy for narcissists. He only does, you know, he only work with, with some people with, you know, narcissistic traits or narcissism. Uh, but only work with them on the 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 the, the part of the complex PTSD. So on yeah, the- and that's go. Ahead. Sorry, go ahead, James. Oh, I was going to say I kind of noticed within myself as I look back, like right after discard, I was pretty much in fight mode like all the time. Mm-hmm. Not going to take any crap from anybody. If I see abuse or somebody abuses me, I'm going to call you out right then and there on it. And that's, that's just it. And it kind of went away after the first month or two, but I think it's important to note. So people don't read that and think, Oh my God, maybe I'm a narcissist. It's very possible. You're just kind of, you're like the dog that just escaped the cage where you were being abused. And now you're ready to bite anybody that that even goes to pet you or even talk to you. You know, this this is what I was talking about earlier, how, when people get re in tune with that anger, 
yeah. after abuse and they realize what has happened to them, they tend to go to the opposite side. Yeah. Whereas before they were so determined to make this relationship work. They were so locked into that fawn mode where it's so people pleasing. I'll forgive you for whatever you do. As long as you tell me whatever I need to hear, I'm going to keep forgiving you. And um, I'm going to keep trying to make this work and people pleasing and all of this stuff. And then uh, generally it's, if they, if they're fortunate and they get discarded, then seriously, because it, yeah. the other option is to stay in that and just get dragged through hell until they die. And it's just a long, slow, miserable death really. But if they, if they're able to get discarded um, and then they, that's when they start getting like, it's that kind of um, getting back into their anger of how could you do this to me? I should have earned I should have earned your loyalty and your love and your respect. Look at everything that I did for you. And this is how you treat me. And when they go to that opposite end, that's when you see a lot of that fortressing with boundaries, that isolation there, it's a hairpin trigger on yeah. them. <laughs> and, you know, I know I was there too, or yeah, yeah, me too. Of rage scared me because I am not, I don't do, that's not me. <laughs> I didn't used to do anger at all. So having to suddenly deal with a lot of it was kind of like scary to me, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was terrifying. Yeah. I had to box because for me, that energy inside of me, like cooking, I'm like, what am I going to do? I feel like a dragon. <laughs> I'm going to burn this thing. Yeah. One breath. <laughs> and it does take a lot more energy than the V the other way. So. You know, yeah. it's, it's, it's really uh, interesting because today I was re-listening re 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 to some of the chapters and he was saying there that, um, you know, really managing CPTSD is like managing diabetes. diabetes. And I, I've, been, I've been saying it to some of my friends. It's just like, this is like my mental diabetes. And, um, you know, all, all, all of the things, you know, all of the flashbacks, all of the flight, fight, you know, responses, like, you know, Basically, when you read this book, you just have to kind of single out what are your symptoms and you can manage your symptoms just like, you know, diabetic has to monitor the insulin and what they eat, you know, and then guess what? That doesn't really need to impact the quality of your life in such a large way, especially once you start, you know, managing it well. Yeah. Now, once you make a habit of, of addressing those things in your daily life, it's not something you have to really think about anymore. It becomes automatic where mm -hmm. you like just, nature. you just take care of it. And yeah. So it, it, don't look at this as like, oh my God, I'm going to have to manage this for the rest of my life. And because that, that's just an overwhelming thought. And it's, and it's not yeah. like that. It, it gets well, a whole lot better. As long as you take a couple of things at a time and work on it, and then it becomes second nature and then move on to the next couple, you'll be all right. Yep. Yeah, yep, I agree. So just as kind of um, a recap here, because we were talking about narcissism and the fight defense this whole theory about these four F's and everything, it's basically if a child um, that we're all born with, you know, kind of an inbred temperament and through kind of nature and nurture is how these different um, four F defenses kind of happen. So um, that there's, you know, like the fight, flight, freeze, and then fawn. And so the narcissism and sociopathy on the extreme end, it's a person that tends to become more locked into this fight response. But, and he talks about, it, he's like, I, you know, there's no, I can't treat somebody who isn't able to admit that they have, a, they're so defensive that they can't admit that they have a problem. Like that's never going to work for anybody, narcissist or otherwise, if somebody, an alcoholic, an anorexic, whoever, if they don't see that they have a problem and there's no motivation to change, they're not going to change because therapy isn't something that you do to somebody. It's you do therapy with somebody. So like they've got to be a willing participant, but no change is possible if there's no internal motivation, you know, to change. So that's the challenge. So all, all these people that, uh, survivors of abuse, they're like, I'm terrified that I might be a narcissist. I, um, there are these things with me. I noticed I've been really terrible to, you know, um, I don't know, I yell a lot and I lie a lot and I have all these behaviors and I, this, I'm scared because, um, you know, uh, I don't want to be this way. If there's that internal sincere desire, 
sincere desire to be like, oh, these are things that I want to work on and I want to change, then by all means, go for it. Uh, it's mm-hmm. when a person has all that behavior and it works for them and they have no desire to change that it's a problem. So, uh, and they're not likely to be agonizing over any of that. <laughs> oh no, because they're, they're getting rid of all their guilt and shame by justifying their behavior. Oh, I cheated on you because you know, it was your fault. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I stole from you because I needed money. I, uh, kicked the dog because I got angry. I shook the baby because it wouldn't stop crying. Like there's no, there's no bound. There's no line in the sand for like what's appropriate or what's not appropriate. Like their moral compass is whatever they feel justified in doing in the moment. And that's a problem. Zero ownership at all. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. But when you, you know, if, when you just have, uh, like James was describing, when you just have a, a fight, you know, as your defense mechanism, and it's like kind of, um, you know, on a high volume right now, uh, the way you actually heal it is that you acknowledge the problem that like you, 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 you usually acknowledge that it has more to do with your uh, childhood with the heart in your childhood. I'm trying to go back to your nose, then I'm trying so hard. Yeah, I noticed that. Because <laughs> we can talk so much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so basically, you, 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 you get present that, you know, you're not really fighting the person in front of you. You know, that fight response is not caused with what's happening in front of you. It's really caused that, you know, by what happened in your childhood, that, you know, your intimacy needs and everything were not fulfilled. It was all destroyed and, you basically have, you know, it's it's overwhelming need to fight with someone. And, you know, that's exactly what James was describing when, when he left. So the way to deal with that is you need to grieve. And uh, this is not the first time we talk about it. You know, almost every book we, we, we discuss in the book club on this channel is that, you know, it's mentioning the power of grieving what happened. And, you know, grief, grief, you have to literally cry so much that you bowling <laughs> and i'm laughing about it because i've done it so many times that mm-hmm. it's like it's nothing well, <laughs> you're gonna look miserable don't take pictures don't record videos just hide in the room and cry like a crazy person and you'll be better <laughs> do what you gotta do <laughs> yeah uh see sandra here had mentioned i think it was sandra i had mentioned before about cptsd um you know, really not being used as a diagnosis. Uh, and, you know, basically, cause it's not in the DSM and, and that's, that's true. Like mental health professionals, you have to, you have to be able to justify your treatment plan. So you have to use DSM what's in the DSM. And there's other kind of um, di- di- codes really that can be used, but, um, so that that's why. So it's it. I don't know. It's it's a complicated kind of messy thing. It's just confusing for people that are trying to get help. And CPTSD isn't something that's I think widely known because it's of course it's not in the DSM yet. So hopefully someday. Yeah. Um, I can I address this quickly. Yeah. So I was thinking about it because I've been misdiagnosed in so many ways. And to to be honest with you, you know, looking back labeling me with whatever you know even telling me i have complex ptsd would not make a difference but just like looking at all the different symptoms i have and instead of focusing on trying to label me but just you know i was paying out of the pocket anyhow so mm-hmm. you know there was no paperwork that had to be submitted anyway so you know if you go to the therapist don't walk in saying hey i have complex ptsd because that's just gonna start a conversation that it's not gonna really benefit you it just won't yeah. But if you walk in there and you, you know, just pick a few symptoms that you know that if you deal with those symptoms, it will open a door for you to deal with another one. So I don't know, go and say, hey, I'm really beating up on myself all the freaking time. Literally, I have this voice in my head, you know, oh, maybe not voice, but I, because they will say you have schizophrenia. <laughs> So I just say that, you know, you, you criticizing yourself all the time, you sabotaging yourself, just, you know, describe the symptoms that you have the hardest time with and, you know, and, and, and roll up. Here's the thing. And I think this is, this is so, so important. Therapist is there for you. 
for you. You're not mm-hmm. walking there to make a therapist happy. You're not going to therapy to work with the therap- you know, therapist on what therapists want to work on you. No, therapist is there for you. And you are, you know, I want you to feel empowered to walk into the therapist's office and ask the therapist to support you to work on the things that you need to work on to get better, to function in your life. You can do it. Yeah. And if that scares you, that's part of the people pleasing thing. And, and that can be overcome. Just Well, and I also say too, I think one of the challenges is, is the therapist might have a different view of what's going on um, and other issues. There might be kind of a divide on kind of what they're seeing versus what a person is going in for. It's difficult. It's, it's, I'm not saying that one of them is right or wrong because sometimes a therapist might have more insight and be like, you know what, actually you're saying one thing, but I'm seeing something else. So I think a good therapist, there's, they're at least able to have that conversation um, and being able to, to work together. But I just wanted to address the labels too. I think it's just important to realize these labels, um, they can make a person feel so profoundly broken. And I think that's the downside of it. But please realize if you're, if they have to submit paperwork to an insurance company, they have to put something down. Mm -hmm. You can't just treat a patient that has no diagnosis for a physical condition or for an emotional condition. So some, something has to be put down and there's, there's different, like I said, there's different codes in the DSM. Not everything is, um, like an official diagnosis, there's other things in there that you might see. So I guess if you see, what I'm saying is, you know, if you see a series of codes um, or disorders or uh, diagnoses or what have you, that's just, it, it kind of shorthand so that it's, so that billing covers it so that insurance covers it, but it's more about the behaviors than the diagnosis. Like you treat the behaviors, you don't treat the diagnosis. So I guess, please don't feel profoundly broken. If you're like, you get something back and you're like, oh my gosh, I've got all of these things going on with me. It is my fault. I am profoundly broken. Um, Cause that happens a lot. And in fact, one of the, the uh, most uh, dangerous times for a person is after, if they end up going into a psychiatric hospital or going to uh, getting diagnosed, they're, the increase in suicide is significantly higher after they get a diagnosis. And it's because of that feeling of, oh, great, like now I have borderline personality disorder or oh, great, now I have PTSD, my life is over. I don't want to be that person shuffling down the street with a shopping cart that, you know, the war veteran on the corner, because that's what they imagine of PTSD. I can't function. I'll never be, be able to connect to other people again. Um, so just let that be said, but let, let me get back to the, um, the note. So yes. So Agatha was saying about healing the fight defense. So there's a whole section in this book. Again, you can find my notes on this thriveafterabuse.com under book club notes, where I go through all of this. Cause he talks about, I love this where he talks about these different defenses, what they look like when they're in balance, what they look like when they're out of balance and the importance of these different defenses and how to heal them. So if we're locked into one or two, how to start shifting out of that. So like Agatha was saying that healing that fight defense involves um, a lot of doing a lot of grief work and assigning appropriate blame and figuring out, okay, this anger is stemming from childhood or wherever it might be stemming from and then working through that. The flight defense leaves a person feeling it's avoidance mixed with anxiety. And when that defense is in balance, it's knowing when to retreat or disengage from problematic people or situations. A person's able to keep themselves preoccupied. They have constructive daydreaming. They're creative, they're efficient, and they're self-motivated. When the defense is out of balance, it's obsessive compulsive behavior, it's drivenness, it's a busyholic. Uh, can lead to mood disorders, constant thinking, so like ruminating thoughts. They can pursue reckless activities, feel addicted to adrenaline, uh, avoidance, sleeping. Uh, ADHD is often diagnosed when it's an extreme flight. Uh, Emotional collapse, they can numb out, give up, and continual disassociation. 
in order how they connect to other people, they attempt to be perfect in order to connect to others. And in order to feel safe, it's the feeling of, um, oh, an attempt to be perfect in order to feel safe. It's the thinking of, I will be good enough or lovable enough once I achieve X, Y, Z goal, for example. So it's this continual drive for um, being productive, I guess, basically. Um, let's see. Is it also um, somebody that avoids all confrontation at all cost because they can't stand any kind of even a healthy disagreement or like a discussion or like a heated discussion? Um, yeah. I think it could be. Yeah. Uh, I think, yeah we, I'm mm -hmm. sorry. I have, I have a flight response made, so we do not like any kind of conflict. And I, I would put that in that category too. Yeah, totally. And then uh, one of the things that it, it got really, really cl clear to me uh, when I was, you know, reading his, because he addresses it throughout the book in different places, but this is what gets me to dissociate into my being, doing. So I'm away from my being most of the time. So that, I don't know if he said there's a left side or right side dissociation. I do actually both. But uh, mm -hmm. the flight is what, that's why I'm so preoccupied because I don't like to be with my thinking and, you know, being present to what's happening. So I'm all about doing, 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 doing. And I'm, I'm, I'm running into the doing. <laughs> mm -hmm. so. Yeah. And so he had said for healing the flight defense is uh, learning relaxation techniques and making time to be still and present and being in the moment. Uh, so then the next defense is freeze. And this one he describes as avoidance and constant disassociating. And the quote he gave in the book, which I thought was cute, he said, basically, don't just do something, stand there. So it's like, you're just, you're just you're frozen. And I'm like, oh my gosh, that's not ever accurate. Um, and, but when this, when that defense is in balance, it's mindfulness, awareness, and presence. You're able to be still and be in the moment. When that defense is out of balance to an extreme, it's disassociation, it's hiding, isolation, becoming a couch potato, not trying, so becoming achievement phobic. And I would say part of that disassociation, it's, you know, it's losing yourself in fantasy, it's losing yourself in daydreams. Oh, I losing guess yourself we'll online. <laughs> huh? I forgot those two confused because I have them two together. So me yeah. too. Yeah. 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 If you have a lot of trouble being still. Yeah. Um, how I got around that was uh, I, I did a lot of walking meditations instead of sitting my body still. That was a good gateway for me to learn how to be present in my body without having to fight with being mm -hmm. still. So, yoga. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yoga is another mm -hmm. You know, yeah. any, anything where you can be present in your body, it doesn't necessarily mean you have to not move at all. Mm -hmm. you, you can still move. It, it's, it's more the focus on, on current moment, awareness of your movement and how you feel in your body and all of that. Then you, you don't have to sit there and not have a thought pop in your head or move a muscle. It doesn't have to be that way. <laughs> yeah. And he goes into this, Agatha, what you were saying about left brain and right brain disassociation, the right brain um, and a person can go back and forth between them. Right brain is tiredness, excessive sleep, self-distraction. So anything to excess, you're working a lot, you're, um, you know, anything to distract yourself, daydreams. Mm -hmm. And you also put in there, all of this is the opposite of verbal ventilation. Yes. And I really liked that he pointed that out. I don't think I would have connected that. And I think yeah. that's just brilliant. Um, so instead of actually, you know, asserting ourselves and bringing up, hey, this is what's going on. These are the issues that I have. We're, we're just running away and we're avoiding. The left brain disassociation, he says, is obsessiveness, trivialization, and focusing on uh, sports statistics or celebrity lives, intele intellectualization, and overly focused thinking. And he'd said, and this I'll give an example here in a second, logic is used in an attempt to protect from the messy world of feelings. And I see this a lot with um, 
in a couple different ways, like with on different online groups with, I would say like incels, if you're familiar with those guys, um, the involuntary celibate crowd, they've really carved up the world in this kind of very quote unquote, like intellectualized, logical to them kind of way that it's really sad. It really reinforces the sense that they're, that they're unworthy and that they will always be unworthy. Um, but another, I, mm -hmm. sorry, it's because what you're saying is exactly what I'm trying to, you know, I'm wondering about that. Like, this is something like I'm really, you know, mm -hmm. I have a question about it in my brain. Uh, do you guys think that that freeze and the flight response is usually for people who have like a very overwhelming sense of shame, feeling of shame? Because that's that's what it connects with me. That I, the especially the freeze. Like people who are very present to feeling very ashamed of what's what happened. I think it's possible. Um, yeah. I think it just depends on their genetic makeup. Yeah. All of these are kind of shame based. But it could be. I mean, it could be an extreme. That's I think an interesting question. The freeze could. Yeah. Because I, I feel like, especially like if you, the opposite of the verb of vent ventilation, like you're not able to say what's happening because you were just too ashamed to say it. I don't know. I was just like thinking about it. Yeah. I don't think my inquiry will benefit anyone right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's my personal inquiry. I'm going to take it home with me. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's interesting. I mean, that's the thing. This book, it brings up so many questions. Um, you know, I think it's hard to, to kind of turn it off when you're just thinking like all the different connections that could be there and how does this pertain and, and this, that, and the other. It's, it's interesting. Yeah. Um, and so let's, let's see. So how um, do we connect to others, right? That's when we, we stopped. Yes. So this is kind of along the lines of what you were just saying is people with this freeze defense, they generally don't. Or if they do, it's online or in a very limited way. They hide or avoid from others in order to feel safe. Um, so healing the freeze defense involves building trust so that the person is able to examine the role of past traumas and their suffering. This then paves the way for the work of grieving the losses of childhood. The anger work of grieving that can help is through, and he says it can help through uh, an aerobic exercise regime. So because they might- have a question. Uh -huh. <laughs> Sorry, because this is, this, I think this, this can help people because Probably just like you and I, and I think Shay, you too, we both go between those two responses, the flight and the freeze. Mm -hmm. And I, it's really crazy because I think that's what makes us very, um, what are you calling that? Very like almost like contradict, we're almost like contradicting ourselves in our responses because here when I'm freezing, when I'm in my freeze, I'm super mindful. Like I am aware of the, smallest thing around me and i can be very very focused wait 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 wait. Right. but but i can't i can't sit still at all but it, is it mind okay because okay, okay, what you're describing like mindfulness implies some sort of balance there well he says that there are positive things so i you know like it's funny because i feel like i always fit I always thought that I have problem with being mindful, but he says that actually you can be mindful if you are in your freeze response. That's a positive part of it. And I'm like, oh, right. if it's in balance, if it's in balance, that's the thing. But if it's because we all have all of those defenses, you know? Yes. So like, so yeah, I, um, yeah, if, if you've got a, I guess that would be a way to determine, like if you're able to find a good balance, if it's working for you. Yeah, I think if you're able to be mindful, that's definitely a positive thing. Yes. That's the, it's the, um, yeah, I guess that would be a way, like if it's your subtype. So like if your primary type would be flight and your subtype would be freeze, but then you're noticing, okay, you know what, maybe five years ago, um, you were like me and you freeze and then you sleep too much or you're, you're doing stuff like that. But now you're like, you know what? I'm actually, I sleep less, but I'm finding that I'm able to be still more often and I'm okay with being still and I can 
be, you know, um, well, you're kind of in an interesting spot because painting involves being still and being active. (laughs) I feel like I literally have periods of my time of my life when I can be super, super mindful. And then I have periods of my life when I cannot sit still for one second and I go through it. And I, and I literally, I read this summer that everything is like a cycle in your life. So I am going through the cycles. And I think people say like, you can have a I think after you just leave uh, a business relationship, you're on the very short cycles of everything. So in a day, you can go through like dinner and dinner and like this, right? Then mm-hmm. get extended, extended. So right now, for me, are longer the cycle, which is a part of healing because you just got more, more like there's more moderation in it. You're not that extreme in the changes. But mm-hmm. I was reading it and I'm like, well, I wonder if everyone has the same. Like there are moments when you can be super mindful and aware. And, Mm -hmm. you know, and even if you were in your freeze response. I think that's interesting. It makes me wonder if people who have a lot of the freeze response find it easier to become mindful because of it. Because I mean, I know that was freeze flight was my thing totally. (laughs) You know, possibly, I think if, I think he's so spot on with this, that if a person, if you, if they're the flight freeze type, there's going to, my guess would be that there need to be a lot of mind body work to pull them together because that's what it was for me. I remember yeah. going to yoga when it was kind of first becoming a thing, like 15 years ago or however long. I couldn't do it first. <laughs> I couldn't do it. And I, I didn't get it. I was like, I don't get this. This is just like 90 minutes of stretching. I'd rather just go on the treadmill and run or go take a kickboxing class. I'm getting nothing out of this. And I couldn't figure out what was wrong with me because everybody else was like, oh, that was so amazing. I'm so relaxed. And I'm like, I don't know. I'm so over it. Like I got nothing out of it. <laughs> and then, and then I, I had an instructor at some point who taught me how to actually feel my body, like feeling certain muscles, stretching, feeling tension, feeling pressure moving your breath to different areas of your body. And it was the most wild thing. Cause I'm like, how did I not feel, it feel any of this before? Like I'm in my body all the time. So like, how does that, how does that happen that I'm a stranger in my own skin? <laughs> yeah. Weird. Well, to just, uh, you know, I guess this will be another private inquiry, but I just had the thought that we are just so freaking amazing people. We made in such a marvelous way. And, you know, there are contradictions inside and, you know, I guess integrating it and just finding balance, you know, it's, it's the key over here. It is. I mean, I really feel like you know, as a human being, we're basically, you're born into like the equivalent of a Lamborghini, just this high end machine. And, you're just continually like learning all these different things that you can do. And I definitely have to agree with that. It's very fascinating. It is. It's really cool. (laughs) The worst is we look in the mirror. We don't see Lamborghini. (laughs) Just like, yeah. Speak for yourself. (laughs) (laughs) That's a different book. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. What kind of car would you guys be? If you were a car. BMW. I don't know why I like BMW. She, you didn't I, with that. I don't want to have to pick just one, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> You'd probably be the Batmobile. Okay, I'll, I'll roll with that. <laughs> what would you be, James? A Bugatti. Oh. You, God, you guys. Wow, you guys. <laughs> First thing that came to mind, so I went with it. I could see Shay being um, a convertible top Jeep Wrangler. It would have to be a convertible top. That's my thing. Yeah. What do you know about Shay that you say that? I'm I don't know. She She's just... probably seen me post on Facebook about driving with the top down. And no, no, I've <laughs> never seen that. I, I, I would have discussed that. You just see him like uh, sunshine and wind in your hair and um, yep. outdoors and exploring kind of, kind of gal. Yep. You nailed it. Okay. What do you see in me? I can't look at you and not think about painting. I have that association. Yes. I see I'm, I see a lot of color involvement and I should be that what is that 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 car that the uh, hippies used to drive? Volkswagen the flowers, Beetle. The flowers all over. The mystery machine. Yes. 
I could see you as a little Volkswagen bug. Yeah, that would be cool. That's like a pa- like pastel yellow or something or pastel blue with the flowers and the little flower inside. All right. Well, Before- they make the new ones now that are GT. So I think you'd be one of the GTs. Oh, you could be a sporty new- one. Yeah. Sport. If they make it eco-friendly, like electric, I get one. And they even learn how to drive, maybe. It's eco-friendly if you take your foot off the gas sometimes. <laughs> okay, uh, why don't we go to the phone response? <laughs> yes, I'd be curious. You guys in the chat, what kind of car would you... If you were a car, what kind of car would you be and why? Jennifer is a Tesla. Uh, you, y'all just are... Yeah, I know. when i leave there's so many teslas now on the street i'm like yeah go people bonnie is saying she'd be a vw van i think i would be too honestly i could see that yep it's kind of self-sufficient self-contained rambling around just exploring i would i would love that cool okay <laughs> Sorry, sidetrack. We're going on trips today. <laughs> yes, we are. Okay, so back back to this, uh, the differences. Uh, Did we just have a flight thing there? No, it was like an advertisement <laughs> for no, um, different makes and models of cars. Right, right. Yeah, that was a uh, hashtag hidden, not sponsored. Hidden, right, <laughs> hidden sponsorship for a uh, <laughs> yeah, all of those cars, <laughs> all of those cars. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Okay, so then. The fawn defense, this is the one he focuses a lot on in the book because this is the one defense that primarily does seek help. Um, you know, the fight ones are too defensive. The flight ones, you can't get them to come in. They're out avoiding, they're too busy working 80 hours a week and trying to avoid everything. The freeze ones are stuck at home on the couch or sleeping. Sleeping, come on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the fawn ones are the ones that finally come in because they're like, my life isn't working. And I have all of these, I'm continually being mistreated and I can't figure out why. Yeah. So um, the fawn defense, again, out of balance, it's ingratiating behavior. It's overly compliant, overly friendly, overly trusting. When this defense is in balance, it can lead to compromise, fairness, peacemaking, and listening. When this defense is out of balance, it's codependence, it's a loss of self, a person becomes a doormat, a domestic violence victim, a parentif- parentified child. I wanted to just mention this here. It's not only people with the fawn defense that can become DV victims. It's, it's really anybody because this stuff's not taught and how to stay grounded in yourself is not taught. So, um, Yeah, I how- wish he had said that in the book. Did he? Okay. Good no, up. I said I wish he would have. Oh, he would. Uh, yeah, yeah. I wish I wish he would have as well. Um, so, how the fawn defense people connect to others is that they are overgivers. They overlisten. They overdo. They merge with another person in order to connect to them. This leads to blurred or non-existent boundaries on their end and enabling and ingratiating behavior in order to feel safe. The reason for this is that they're sacrificing parts of themselves, such as their dignity, self-esteem, and identity, in order to keep the relationship going. And uh, how they attempt to keep themselves safe is that they grovel and they're being ever forgiving, uh, basically focusing on this problematic person help, it helps them to avoid risking rejection. Um, so let's see. I need to go through my notes. Some of the stuff repeats here. Um, healing the fawn defense involves reducing the amount of listening and overgiving in general, I would say, as well as practicing and broadening the verbal and emotional self-expression. Many become motivated to work on becoming more assertive when they realize that saying no triggers them into a flashback. Grieving the loss of having to stifle ourselves helps to reclaim the developmentally arrested self-expression. So um, I think that's a later stage of self-awareness. It's just been my experience that people tend to kind of show up when they're in crisis. They're right on the brink of a divorce. They're afraid that their partner is going to kill them. Things are really extreme. They can't handle it anymore. They're suicidal they're at this, this breaking point. And then, so they're motivated to get out of that level of pain. Mm-hmm. And then that's when this kind of whole journey towards self-exploration starts, but it starts with the focus on 
oftentimes the other person, this other person is causing me so much pain. How do I get this to, how do I change them or fix them? And then over time that grows into um, that deeper level of self-awareness of learning what flashbacks are and realizing and being in tune with ourselves enough to realize when we're experiencing one. So having that conflict with another person or that confrontation um, and then that self-awareness of, oh my gosh, why am I resisting this? Why am I so terrified to, to tell somebody, hey, that's not okay, or hey, we need to do something different, or why is this? Oftentimes it stems back from childhood of if I assert myself, they're going to either lash out or they're going to leave me. Yeah, I like the part in the book where he talked about, um, I think he said something like, you're with your parents at the dinner table and you say something. And it means like you're going to get ridiculed or you're going to get um, like, you're going to pay for it later on. That kind of hit yeah. home with me. Just yeah. like what you were talking about. Yeah, I agree. And um, C. Finn wanted some clarity. It says, so grieving the loss of our fawning self. Uh, I think it's more grieving the loss of having to stifle ourselves. So that realization. So just what James was talking about, you realize, oh my gosh, no voice no voice. This yeah. is where this came from around a dinner table. I wasn't allowed to have an opinion or any, I, had, I wasn't allowed to do anything other than agree. Right. You're allowed to have an opinion as long as it, you know, goes with, with, what they, with their opinion. So stay yeah. in your box, stay in your box. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, um, but I think also, I don't know, I, I don't, at least not for me or for most people, and you guys set me straight if I'm off on this. For me, it wasn't so much the grieving, the loss of the fawning self. It was grieving the loss of um, relating to others in that way and realizing, oh my gosh, all, all of my relationships had been imbalanced because I was, when I was in that defense of trying to maintain peace, that people pleasing over giving side, there was this imbalance there. I was never showing up and being authentic and being able to assert myself. Um, and as a result, none of these relationships were ever very fulfilling. Yeah, I, re I relate more to what you just said. Yeah, you mean I, like I, in an unhealthy way, like like attachment wise, like you're you're being overly um, like almost smothering kind of because you're listening so much and you're trying to people please and, and make them happy. Well, he okay. goes into like, there's different subtypes within codependence. Mm -hmm. I don't feel that I don't, I think if, if I have actually not, if the kind of um, smothering behavior I had was, and I is still there is this need to try to fix other people. Mm -hmm. It's this yeah. obsessive helping. So kind of reeling that in and being like, okay, I'm only going to give advice when I'm asked for it. So and I'm only, it's, it is. And, and I think, you know, I think most people struggle with that, but um, kind of just reining that in and find in, in finding that balance. Uh, for, me, mm -hmm. for me, it was in, in, you know, grief. What I, what I had to grieve here is that when I was, you know, acting in a codependent way, basically there was no intimacy present, no, no true connection with people. So basically yeah. I grieve that no one never knew me. Like mm. that, that, so basically you're grieving because you feel like at the end of the day, you're like very, very lonely, disconnected, and no one really knows who you are. Well, I understand you. You don't, you don't I think that comes that. very closer to the core of it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I think that, that kind of grief, what got me out of it, because, you know, like I said before, my main two were the flight and freeze, but you know, then I went through that. And I think, I think as a child, you know, as a child, I was more into the uh, fight and freeze, but then, you know, somehow I transitioned into the phone and that's what got me into the very toxic marriage or, you know, of our relationship. And then at the end of the, the, the day, you grieve the, it's almost like you, you're you grieving the impact of it all on, on you not being able to connect with people anymore. And you kind of lo lost yourself in all those responses. Yeah. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. Well, you realize might be that your personality really isn't your personality. It's a defense mechanism. Yes. And that, who the heck am I? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and then kind of learning to, to, I mean, you just start waking up to who you are and, um, interacting with people in a very different way. It's, it's a very strange, um, but exciting, I think, kind of process yeah. to rediscover yourself. It's the caterpillar becoming the butterfly. Uh, and I think, you know, what you were saying, Agatha, and I hadn't really ever thought about that before, but yeah, when we're, or at least I hadn't thought about it in the way that you articulated it, which I really liked about how nobody knows us. And one of those core symptoms of all of this is that pervasive feeling of emptiness. And I think that's exactly where that comes from is we don't know us. Therefore, other people can't know us and we don't abandon yourself. Yeah, we've abandoned ourselves, and then we can't, we're not connecting to other people. And I think a lot of us are walking around feeling profoundly empty, but we don't know why. And I think that's why, because it's, again, that goes back to all of this stuff. It's weird because we're living in these bodies (laughs) and all of this stuff is going on in our brain and our experience, and we're not aware of it. It's just the trippiest thing. To realize, you know, but once it's kind of pointed out, it's like, oh my gosh, yeah, I didn't realize that was an issue, but, Mm -hmm. but it is. So yes, reclaiming your sense of self, your thoughts, your opinions, your wants, your needs, uh, becoming assertive, finding that balance is a very big part and getting re in tune with the fight response. Um, because that healthy fight response, being able to shift in and out of these different responses when they're appropriate is that's, that's what it is about being kind of a healthy, well-adjusted person. And, um, that fight response, the beauty of that is that's our ability to feel self-protective and it fuels that. So boundary standards, deal breakers, assertiveness, all stem from having a healthy fight response. <laughs> So, uh, and if you, if you don't have, like, I struggle with fight response, I, what I recommend is either take some self-defense classes or boxing classes. It's, it helps. Yeah. I think that's a good idea. Yeah, I do. It really helps. Sam had mentioned here in the chat and I, um, he says, uh, something, I was always protective of others. Um, uh, let's see. So the fighter, the fighter fawn mode, a lot, we were talking about this early before we went live. Um, for a lot of us that experienced the fight mode, it was generally only in defense of other people. So I know for me, that was my primary thing. Um, you know, as, as a nurse, I was a great advocate because I really went to bat for my patients and, any, any buddy that I saw that was, you know, being mistreated, it would bring out the mama bear in me. And it was in a still, I'm still very much that way. And it's just been recently kind of realizing that's great, <laughs> but then what about you? Do you know what I mean? Like you got to gotta include you. Gotta well, it's a lot easier to defend somebody else than to defend yourself, which is, is kind of weird to think about, but it's true. Well, I think especially if you're locked into more of um, the flight or, fr- well, any of the other ones, flight, freeze, or fawn, it's... If you're not there because you're flighting and freezing, what are you going to defend? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know it sounds silly, but there's some kind of truth in that too. Yep. Yep, absolutely. Um, so let's see here. Then, he, again, this theory, I'm not sure if this is Pete Walker's theory or if where this came from. I, it's interesting. I just really like the whole four F type. So his, this theory is, so when a person, and you can see this in children, when you're like, I mean, young, young kids, you can see this in like first grade where you've got kids that are kind of defaulting more to a certain personality style. And especially the kids that are the bullies and that are you're like, Ooh, that kid's not on a good path. If there's not that, if there's not a successful intervention that's able to be made, um, then this theory is okay. Then these children grow up and then there's these other 
kind of uh, disorders that come from that. So for example, with the fight defense, if that's not addressed and handled, that anger is not resolved and, and understood that need for control and that, that drive to rage at people because they're, contro- they're gaining power in their life through controlling others and then through raging at them, then that can lock into narcissistic uh, personality disorder, antisocial personality disorder, conduct disorders when they're younger. Uh, I think a lot of that also tends to be kind of different, um, you know, kind of reactive attachment disorders, again, when they're younger. Sometimes interventions can help and can help you know, an older child shift out of that, but it's, you know, it's, it's difficult. So, so he has it listed here. So fight defense can lead to narcissistic personality disorder type stuff. Uh, The um, flight defense can lead to obsessive compulsive or anxiety disorders. The freeze defense to an extreme, again, it's a dissociative, uh, where he had also talked about um, uh, schizophrenia and I think other types of like avoidant personality disorder type things. And then the fawn is more of a codependent and I would say probably dependent personality disorder. So uh, once these defenses become the default, then the default way a person responds to stress or the inner critic, they remain locked in as adults until they get quote unquote, good enough therapy. And these default defenses are thought to be determined by birth order, genetics and environment. But recovering the fight response is vital in recovering from CPTSD for those of us in the, you know, fawn, freeze, flight ones. Uh, we use the fight response for interrupting the inner critic, setting and holding boundaries, realizing that when we've been mistreated and making our healing a priority. And you can tell when you have unprocessed trauma. I really like that he said this. You can tell when there's unprocessed trauma or emotional wounds present when you are overusing one or two of these defenses. Yep. I just thought, bingo, that is yep. brilliant because it's, it can be so difficult to tell Like, have I dealt with everything? Like, I don't know. How many stones do I need to keep turning over when, like, I don't know. Because you're you're searching, you know, with with having these major blind spots because it's how you've always been. So it's it's really challenging. But I just thought that was just genius on his part to connect that. Yeah. Uh, Let's see. Okay, then there's the subtypes. Oh gosh, this is long. I don't know if we, do we want to go? This could be a (laughs) three-parter. I I agree. I mean, Uh, I think that the the subtest of the four of us, if you can, we can just quickly say that, you know, you know, it depending on which kind of combination of the responses you have, it impacts, you know, the way you are connecting with people, basically. Yeah. And, and, So if, you know, this is the reason why when we're dealing with, you know, struggling with CPTSD, this is the reason why we have such a hard time in, uh, in relationships. So, Mm -hmm. you know, and I don't think actually it's it's that beneficial to say exactly how it impacts over here, but, you know, that just, that's just what explains. So if you really want to deal with it, you can, you know, choose those chapters in the book and, and read over it and, and, you know, Mm-hmm. He, you're right. And we'll do that. We'll just skip over it. People can read my notes about it. It's just, there's so much there and it's, it's important, but I don't want to put people to sleep here. Um, one of the other key takeaways that I had from that is, which I, again, really liked was to think about your dominant type mm-hmm. and then the, the subtype, and then the percentage of time that you spend in each of those responses. I just, again, I thought that was really, really insightful. So like what you were saying earlier, Agatha, about mindfulness and being able to be still sort of like, okay, um, you know, now I'm able to shift in and out of this. And maybe this is like, you know, 5% of the time I'm able to do this and there, you know, it's not a problem, but for me, for example, okay, I'm sleeping, but I'm sleeping way too much. This is actually, you know, 50% of my time every day is 
you know, before not, not doing that anymore. Thank goodness. But 50% of my time is sleeping. So then that can tell you this is a problem because you're spending so much time in this, in this defense. Um, so healing yeah. here and recovery is basically finding out the balance between first the two you have, but ultimately you want to have all four responses available because each of them has a very important function for you in your life. So you need to know how to fawn, how to fly, how to freeze, because you know, and how to fight. All of it is is important for you to to figure out. So if you find that one is uh, on a higher end, right, the spectrum, mm -hmm. basically you you try to, I guess, use the one that is on the opposite and try to balance them out first, and then try the other ways. I, I guess that's what I would go about. I don't know. I don't know necessarily about that, but I think. Um... I, I, maybe, maybe it would be if you realize, okay, yeah, I'm spending 50% uh, um, of my time in freeze, right? I'm sleeping all the time, realizing, okay, this is, this is a type of avoidance. And mm -hmm. even though it might just feel like, no, 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 I just have chronic fatigue. It's like, mm -hmm. okay, well, maybe there, there's a solid chance that there's more there because it, it can be, again, the step is difficult because it doesn't seem like what it actually is. And it's like, okay, if there's a stress component to this, if you're feeling overwhelmed and then you're sleeping, then addressing things further upstream of, okay, if this, if this is a defense mechanism to stress, then how can I go about handling stress differently to yeah. where it's not completely flooring me any little thing and then um, taking time for, you know, self-care and all that. Yeah. I just mm -hmm. realized something that, you know, I said something that may, may you know i don't want anyone who listen feels that like i'm i'm telling them to do something that they are not able of doing right now because you know if you are just you know if 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 you just like i don't know 3 weeks ago last abusive relationship and you are sleeping a lot right now i'm not telling you to stop sleeping a lot i, I, I mean, did your body it. can need that yeah i, mean, yeah. I, mean, I slept 12 like hours that. every yeah day. but that, that's what i'm saying so like you it's here's 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 i think what i'm trying to say which is really important be kind to yourself and if right now you know your defensive uh response is what helps you survive right now because you still just need to survive until you get a little bit better then just go for it all the way in it and love yourself through it if you can and, you know, don't force yourself to be mindful about managing where are your responses and percentage and whatever, what you should work on, because you are not able of doing it right now. And that's okay. Where you are right now yeah. is okay. Forgive yourself for that. Yeah. Give yourself time. Yeah. yeah. And then, you know, with time, I think this is why this book is so brilliant, because you can approach, you know, some of those symptoms you're struggling with in, when you are ready so you can literally go to the content and say, okay, I think, I think I've slept enough and, you know, like now I need to deal with that and you can, you know, you can go for it there. Then. So. I think that's yeah. great advice. Yep. Definitely. Yeah. yeah There's, mm -hmm. Go ahead, James. I was going to just say the reason I slept so long, so much is just to kind of avoid the, um, the day-to-day -day life stresses and thinking about what happened and all that so it's kind of yeah, like i think an there's escape. a lot of factors that go into it there, there's that and yeah. there's you can just be so freaking exhausted from the whole yeah. that you know that that you just literally it's a lot of energy you just burn. yeah mm -hmm. so there, there's a lot that can go into that yeah absolutely the real quick with the different subtypes i think this is worth noting because this is something that comes up all the time in the different live streams um is he brings, and again, I just think this is so brilliant. He has the distinction between the, the, he calls it the fight fawn type and then the fawn fight type. And he, with the fight fawn, that combines the, the defensiveness and the um, kind of controlling behavior of narcissism. And then the fawn defense, which is codependence together and you in this combination you get what he calls the smother or mother this aggressiveness and helping other people 
pressuring others to take their advice that I love you to death. Like I'm just going to be there and not respect your boundaries. I'm just going to continue forcing this help on you. Um, this and interest. And I, he just is so spot on the fond behavior and this personality type is typically devoid of real empathy or compassion. So if you've ever known a person like this, where it's this obsessive need, um, you know, for quote unquote helping or whatever, it's really their way of trying to kind of manipulate and control and so that you owe them something. Yes. Or it's because they're putting on a show of like, oh, see, I'm such a great parent or I'm such a great friend, uh, these kinds of things. And he likens the fight fawn defense hybrid more to border, like true borderline personality disorder where there's narcissism at the core, which I agree with completely. And that's a distinction that's not made ever. It can also be a, a form of asserting oneself as dominant over, because if you're the one helping someone that puts you in an over position and the other person in a less than. So yeah. I, I have seen it done from that standpoint. It's helping from like a place of manipulation. And it's that I love you, I hate you, that continual splitting of true borderline personality disorder. Whereas, and this is the distinction that he makes that I love, uh, is the fawn fight. So the the fawn fight type is going to do that push pull as well, but it's less intensity and there's not that entitlement and um, uh, like, you know, rage. And there's, there's just not that level of intensity there that's there with that fight fawn type. So um, that's yeah, that's a, hmm? it's what? The, it's the passive aggressive then, right? Um. It could be passive aggressive. It could be um, uh, where a person's more fawn and then they, they, they take it, 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 and then they explode, you know? Um, then they I've, I've definitely seen the, the fight fawn be very passive aggressive too. I mean, they, it can yeah. come out in a number of ways. Yeah, I agree. Fight fawn, what I've experienced is it's saccharine sweet and it's, mm -hmm. It truly is, it's just, it's controlling. It doesn't sit well. It feels like there's a hidden agenda because there usually is, whether or not they are even aware of it. Mm -hmm. um, but they're very aggressive and- um, I guess want, too good to be true. It, not even that. I don't even know if it registers as, it might register as too good to be true, but it's, it's, it's just controlling. Like, oh, I really want to help you move, right? And you're like, oh, thanks so much. And then they help you move and then- they're arranging all of your furniture and it's just, it's their way or no way, whatever. It's like you, a takeover. It's a takeover. <laughs> and then if you start asserting yourself, they're like, no, that looks terrible there. You need to put this over here. And then it's just, it's smothering because it's not respecting that other person's boundaries because it was never about helping the other person to begin with. It was about trying to control them. Okay. But that fight fawn person hmm. might not even be, a, I mean, these defenses are deep and we're oftentimes yeah. not consciously aware of them. So uh, I've also seen a, a person flip between like kind of obsequiousness and that controlling thing where, where if you do get where they, if they see you're getting too uncomfortable with it and they're about to push it to, this is more in the beginning, I think they'll flip back to being very, very fawning. But there's, yes. it, it's a really, it, it's hard to describe what I'm talking about. Oh, I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> I can tell by the look on your face. <laughs> yeah. You know, <laughs> where um, they kind of step over a line. And if yeah. you were to say, oh, that, you know, actually, I, I don't agree with that or actually, you know, and the, oh, no, 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 I totally didn't mean that. I just think you're so amazing and wonderful and da, 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 da. And then it, it it's just so saccharine sweet. Mm -hmm. And then that, that personality can be really confusing because it's, you're like, I'm not sure what I'm dealing with here. This person seems really controlling, but then they seem, they seem well-intentioned, but it doesn't feel well-intentioned. Which brings up confusion as a really good point. At yes. Which to yes. Say, hmm. <laughs> yep. That's a problem. All so, right. but then just real quick too, with the borderline personality disorder, because I know that so many people here tend to get diagnosed with borderline personality, after, especially after abuse, because of these extreme behaviors. It's I love you, I hate you, I, um, you know, I'm angry at you, I'm not angry at this. The kind of um, impulsiveness, the the continual 
you know, pattern of unstable relationships. There's a lot of things there, uh, abandonment issues, uh, these kinds of things. So just please know that if you have been diagnosed with borderline personality disorder, there's, it goes deeper that the normal DSM diagnosis just kind of covers surface stuff, but it doesn't mean that you're a bad person. It doesn't mean that you're an abuser. It doesn't mean that you somehow deserved whatever happened to you. Um, well, I've been diagnosed with borderline personality disorder when I was 18 years old. And I know one thing, I don't have it. So don't worry, you'll be fine. Yeah. And even if you do have it, it's, you know, it's not the end of the world. It's, it's behaviors. And, you know, if there's stuff that needs to get in balance and if you're motivated to work on it, it's That's can be worked on. So, um, okay. One can of the, we go to flashbacks or something? <laughs> we haven't even gotten flashbacks yet. Oh my God. I know. Moving on. Point, point number five. So he, talk, he talks about one of the, two of the things that I liked that I thought were important as far as finding a quote unquote good enough therapist okay. it is um, a th- it's really important for a therapist. Uh, and I would say even friends and family of somebody that's struggling with CPTSD to address when a person's falling into that self-hating diatribe. Oh, I'm just stupid. I guess I'll just never get anything right. And no wonder nobody loves me. I, you know, this kind of stuff or the shaming behavior to address that and nip that in the bud and not let that continue and definitely like not join in on it. Um, So that was important. And then the second part, he'd mentioned the importance of balancing psychoeducation with listening and sharing this again, ah, brilliant. Balancing psychoeducation with listening and sharing instead of being a blank slate and only listening. So I know there's been a couple of people in the chat that have talked about problematic experiences in therapy and this book addresses it. He said, this is oftentimes one of them is a lot of therapists are, um, there's, you know, there's different approaches in therapy. And one of them is to kind of be a blank slate because they don't want to assume anything or project their own emotions onto your experience. But being on the receiving end of that can feel really invalidating and it can feel Like they're, why are they quiet? Like, are they judging me or what have you? And so he was saying, it's not helpful for um, a friend or a therapist or whoever to kind of play that blank slate uh, because the person really needs to be validated. And if if the therapist is coming from that blank slate place, it can further reinstill in the other person that uh, uh, perfect parent and then defective child dynamic. So I thought that was, that was good. So that might be something if you're looking for therapists that are familiar in this or trying to work through these things, letting them know these two points, like, Hey, well, could I get I'm sure how I found the therapist? Because I, I look at very specific things. And one of it is I checked, do, do you have I actually ask, what do you think about uh, personality disorders and, you know, the, the, the cluster B personality disorders, you know, uh, do you think they are abusive? What do you think about them? Like I actually asked him, what do you think about it? It was an open question. And based on that answer, I, I went through two therapists and with one, I didn't interact because uh, I kind of felt like she's going to try to work with me on the communication problems. <laughs> that would be a mess. And the other person, uh, which is my therapist right now, uh, you know, because I, 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 I need a therapist to help me communicate with my ex-husband about our daughter because it was going crazy, like really crazy. So the other person responded to me that uh, he understands that he worked with it on both sides. He knows they are not treatable and they are not willing to work in a therapy. Like he responded to me many, like very, like the, the things that we know is obvious, but not they're, they aren't obvious to all therapists. So it's good to, you have a right to ask questions to therapists before you hire him because the therapist will work for you. Yeah. And you can also go in during your session and say, you know what, these are my previous experiences. This is what helped. And this is what was not helpful. But I, I like that he brought up these two points. Cause I think with regardless of how familiar a therapist is with narcissistic abuse or CPTSD or any of this stuff, just to, to say, you know what, Hey, um, 
these two points are really significant. So if you catch me slipping into this self-hating diatribe, please bring it to my awareness and let's address it. And then also I'm going to need some psychoeducation about about all of this. So letting me know like the terms of the definitions, the understanding of boundaries and standards and deal breakers and all of this, because without that psychoeducational component of it, a person's just going to be wandering through the desert. Like that's such a foundational part of understanding this. Um, but that's what cognitive behavioral therapy is about the educational aspect. Of not, not psychoeducation. Well, if it's, well, okay, but if it's done well, it it addresses that, I think. At least my experience. It's more like reframing and focusing on like the connection between the cognitive and the behavioral. But I think there's that piece. From I don't know, my therapist actually oh. gave me a list of books that she would like me to read, which I thought was great. And mm -hmm. I, I learned a lot from those books. So. Yeah, well, that's, yeah, that's helpful if, if, Mm -hmm. they're willing to give you resources and, and all of that. But um, yeah, because it's difficult to to figure this all out. It's impossible to figure it all out. On well, I got really lucky because, you know, I went to like five therapists before and they were all not really that good. And, you oh. know, I, I, I do appreciate how hard it is to find a right therapist. So, And I'll mention too, just because you just said that in the very end of the book, he has like a little interview thing that you can do when you're trying to find a potential therapist. I think that's really cool and it's really helpful. Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. I kind of got lucky and stumbled. And I think I saw, um, I think she had listed, there is a tool online with my insurance, um, the EAP where you can kind of search for therapist and she had, um, like relationship, counseling and marriage counseling and something else that pretty much was like, Hey, I may, may be good at this kind of therapy work. So I guess I got lucky in that, in that regard. Yeah. It's, you know, kind of like finding any other professional. A lot of times it's just trial and error and seeing yeah. who you click with and it should be easier. Though. I, I mean, know. I agree. It's, it's frustrating. Um, so, well, okay. mm -hmm. no, I was just, I was just saying, I think I said that before that what's great is that, you know, you can read a book like this and a couple other books, and then you kind of have an idea of what you need. It empowers you yeah. a yes. bit to make a better therapy decision. Because like yeah, years definitely. ago, I went to the therapy and, and then, then the lion just said that she was completely clueless. And I was clueless too in my first therapy. I had no, I just knew there's something wrong with me. It's wrong. I'm wrong. Something is wrong. My life is wrong. Everything is wrong. And, you know, if you go to the therapist thinking there's just something wrong with me, then you, you are probably going to end up, you know, not getting any results. If, especially if you get therapists that, you know, will just listen to you and engage in the, okay, what's wrong with you? Let's, I don't, I don't know. Yeah. So. yeah. And it's, well, and then the added challenge to that too, is a person might come in and, and um, you know, they're saying, Oh yeah, no, no. It's my marriage. It's, you know, my husband doesn't listen to my, this person, uh, it's communication issues or it's, and we're unintentionally leading them down this, the wrong rabbit hole. Right. And so if they're not picking up on kind of stuff that's not being said, or like that subtly said, that's pointing to, okay, this is actually abuse. And this is more the deeper thing of what's going on here. Um, it's just easy to go down the wrong, the wrong rabbit hole and um, have too much of the wrong information and tell them, tell them that. And then, yeah, that's if you go to therapist and you are in the middle of a flashback. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, just, and that can happen. happen for sure. For sure. And they don't know it's a flashback. So. <laughs> yeah. There's, there's lots of complications with it. Or even if a therapist does recognize that you're being abused, I mean, how many people out there are not going to hear that? They're going to be like, no, 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 I'm not being abused. You're making a big deal out of this. Yeah. It's nothing. And then they get up and then they leave and they never come back. So there's so pretty many, tricky stuff. It is. It's like disabling a bomb. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. yeah, really difficult, difficult stuff. I think that's why there's, um, 
YouTube channels with this and books are so helpful because it, it gives a person that emotional distance of I'm not, I, we're talking and then this other person's listening. So it's not directed at them and yeah. their relationship. So it's easier to kind of take a step back and absorb the information yeah. uh, versus yeah, that's, a good, that's a good point. Yeah. I also love how he addressed that, you know, you can have a friend, like, it, I think he calls it like a therapy by com com by a committee when you can have like a whole network of people that are supporting in your healing and recovery. And, and this is so true because I honestly did most of my healing by myself and just with some of my friends that like, you can literally reparent yourself with your friends and you can reparent each other. And then you can, uh, I mean, you can just basically do everything with, pe with people in your life that are committed to your well being and they are committed to their own well being. And, that, and if there's a roadmap. Yes. And if yeah. you have a roadmap. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. yeah. I, I agree. I agree completely with that. Um, I'm just going to skip to point number seven. And then I wanted to wrap up with what you had said earlier, Agatha. I don't know if you remember about shame and um, yes, date. I remember it. Yeah. Okay. Because you had some brilliance in there. Okay. So we'll just skip over the continuum. We've already talked about that. Basically, healing involves finding that middle ground there. Again, you can find all my notes, thriveafterabuse.com, go under book club, and then it's book club notes is where you can find all this. Um, so point number seven, restoring the balance. It's handling anger and hurt in constructive ways. And, you know, basically getting in tune with your, your wants, your needs, your thoughts, your opinions, these kinds of things. Uh, staying true to yourself, being able to express yourself appropriately and moderately. And then point number eight is understanding flashbacks. Um, I think we've already kind of talked about that. Is there anything that you guys wanted to add? Well, I think it's just important to remember that, you know, like the, the best way to say you are in a flashback is if you are emotionally in like feeling in proportional to what is happening. Yeah. Like when he talks about when you feel small or you feel like you're, um, you feel like super deep shame mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Cause me personally, I, I had no idea that was an emotional flashback. Like I said before, I thought a flashback was like, um, I don't know. You see somebody at the grocery store that reminds you of somebody <laughs> that did something terrible to you. And you like freak out and freeze and just run out the grocery store and because you're <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, it can, but, it can make a huge difference when you start kind of realizing when you have small emotional flash flashbacks and understanding, mm -hmm. okay, I know what that is and start using different strategies to work with it. That that's a very liberating thing that removes a lot of the identification with being defective because, because you understand that it's, a natural thing that's happening to you because of something you experienced. And that, that gives you enough distance from it to kind of start looking at it in a different way and having a different relationship with it. And finally being able to put a name to what you're, what you've been experiencing so often, yeah. like I have, it's like, Oh, okay. Cause now when you get a name for it, then you can begin to kind of, get better it gives about you a direction it it's like huh, yeah, it okay it's a thing i can right. do something with a thing it's super validating yeah. Yeah. yeah i can do something with something that is tangible yep yeah if you know it's a flat you know first of all you know it's a flashback and you you're not just looking around like oh my gosh sometimes i just feel crazy and out of it right yeah yeah it's exactly. huge i mean i know for me it was like i just thought i was moody like i didn't connect it to it, that's, that's such a big part of healing is connecting our emotions to our environment and figuring out, okay, what's going on there? Is, is this significant? Is this trying to tell me something? This is, is this some sort of feedback? And um, yeah, it's just interesting when you kind of realize, okay, yeah, I'm just, it's not just coming out of the blue. There's, there's something going on here. Either it's going on in the present moment or it's going on. It's a flashback from a previous moment. Yeah. Cause I would think like, well, maybe I'm, I guess I'm just too sensitive because right now I feel like I was teleported back to 
when I was a child and mm-hmm. you, know, you get made fun of or laughed at or shamed or ridiculed. And yep. it was really just a, a, a flashback. So yeah. it's, it's crazy. Yeah. That was one of the, I t- think I told you guys before, but when I was in that trauma class, it was so interesting. We had to practice confronting each other in uncomfortable situations. So like having to tell a parent, I have to call CPS on you basically. And um, that, you know, and then practicing the parent becoming really reactive. You're going to ruin my life. You're going to get my kids taken away from me. I can't believe you're going to do this, blah, blah. And how, how to handle that and paying attention to all these different defense, the fight, the freeze, the flight, the step, the fawn that was coming. People, people were like, oh, I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I, you know, I, I have to do this. I please understand. Or the fight of like, you need to sit down and back up you know, if somebody was coming at you or if it was flight of, you know what, I just got to go. I just, I just got to go. And yeah. yeah. Or a freeze where you're just standing there with your mouth open, not knowing how to handle a person who's becoming defensive and upset. And what was so interesting about that was then exploring, okay, well then why are you, where is this coming from? Why are, what does this remind you of? Where are you defaulting to? And I think for a lot of us, it was when somebody starts becoming reactive, it goes back to childhood of, oh my gosh, I'm so afraid that this lady's not going to like me and that she's never going to want to come back or that I've really caused her a lot of damage or that she's going to start yelling at me even more and realizing, oh my gosh, I'm interacting in the situation as a wounded child, not as a healthy, well-adjusted adult. Mm-hmm. And just such a game changer. I really like what, awareness. Sorry. I really like what Kevin said in the chat about deja vu can be a revisiting of trauma. What do you guys think about yeah. that? I didn't yeah, think about that's that. That's interesting. I'd never thought I about that really. in that way. Hmm. Yeah. I don't know. My vision was a usually positive one. So I'm like, no, <laughs> in my head, <laughs> no. Flashback is mostly, for me, associated with feeling ashamed, inadequate, and afraid. That's a good so, distinction. I agree. Yeah. So, yeah, so deja vus, I just like remembering, deja vu would be a little bit more associated with a regular flashback that you experience during the different PTSD, the, the typical PTSD. Or it's just a glitch in the matrix. Um, yeah, but like if there's like, <laughs> trying to compare it because then they have like a whole situation, usually they like pull into something that's happening. They're like taken out of like reality. Like th- their, their flashbacks are different than ours. Mm-hmm. Well, I don't know about y'all's deja vus, but mine, I'm usually like, where, where is this even coming from? What, what the hell? Yeah. Is this I've never confusion. associated deja vu with it, but I can think of times when I've suddenly felt a feeling and it's come to me right away that, oh, this feels exactly like blank. So I can, I can relate to it in that way, but I never yeah. equated, equated it with that. It's interesting. I, I'm positive. I agree. That actually, I think you touched on a really great point there, Shay. Um, in my own experience, when I first started waking up to problematic behavior, that's exactly what I was doing. Of, mm-hmm. ooh, this is so weird. This pro- this person reminds me of this other problematic person, and I did that a handful of times. And then in the end, I would be exactly right. And yeah. so it was like I wasn't aware. I didn't have the vocabulary of the behavior that I was seeing, but I knew I had, I had experienced noticed the same it. behavior before, but I just saw, it wasn't so much, much necessarily deja vu, but it was more of the. Yeah. Huh, that's, that's different than deja vu. Yeah. It's, I've seen it's, that before. It's, it's a few steps to the left. I mean, it's yeah. Yeah, say in that same ballpark of I've experienced this before, but that's mm-hmm. the challenge so many survivors have when they get spun back into that cognitive dissonance. Is it me? Is it them? is this person really problematic or is this my, my past abuse Am I self sabotaging myself? Cause I don't, I'm afraid to feel love or afraid no, to be hurt. You're, you're listening to your gut feeling more you're often than the vast yes. majority of the time. It's your well, sense. You realize of that most people have a few things that are not necessarily healthy. So then there's that too. Yeah. Like behavior wise, you know, Yeah. But I think, you know, once a person starts educating themselves about terminology, vocabulary, uh, just plug my book here, my book start here has all this vocabulary in there. And so once you see 
once you're aware that there's a term for it and that it's not just you know, some issue that you had with your mother 40 years ago, that this is actually a thing that's currently happening. It just, it gives so much clarity. It's like, oh, okay, no, I, this is projection. This is triangulation. This is gaslighting. This is, you know. Yeah, smooth. I like when we use labels to, you know, empower ourselves, not to like replace our identity, you know, <laughs> but like mm -hmm. just to understand something well, then it's good to have a language for it. That is, it is. Very yeah. Good. Yes. Yeah, I agree. So let's shift over to Jennifer had a question last night in the live stream. I said I would answer it, but I was um, wanting to make sure she was going to be on tonight because I know she had something going on. But her question had to do with how how to get over shame in order to have a healthy sex life. But I think we were kind of thinking about changing the question a little bit, how to get over shame in order to what were we saying, Agatha? Dating, no. just dating in general? Well, no, it it will be something that will impact someone's sex life. Gosh, I just okay. I just started celibacy, so this is really awkward for me to talk about. I'm joking. <laughs> it's good. Now, this is this is a very valid question, and I I think that if you are asking the question and you are in a relationship with someone who is healthy person, then uh you know, you addressing shame has, will have a lot to do with you just grieving. Um, you have to grieve so much. There'll be so many, like, I can't give you an answer like, that's what you do because you will be struggling with different things. I can share what was it for me. Mostly it was like grieving how I look at myself as a sex object. Because when you are abused, you kind of, you know, like you start identifying yourself as an object that has to follow the instruction and do what they tell you to do, you know, so you need to grieve loss of that freedom and that, you know, that um, freedom to just experience things. You need to grieve um, and f maybe even forgive yourself if you felt, especially like when you were a child and you were like rewarded for being abused. Like for example, my grandfather, after he abused me, he would buy me things and I accepted those things. So I had to forgive myself because in my mind, in some way, that was my participation in it. So, you know, I forgive myself that and that releases some of the shame. So basically you will, you will struggling, you, you, will, you will be discovering different levels of shame in you. And the only way to deal with it, it will be to grieve it. And then you will be probably also doing work on your inner critic about that because you will have this voice, oh, you are a piece of that or you are bad, you are broken, like you will heal, you know, you will hear those things in your head about yourself because, you know, that's the inner critic, that's what it does. So, you know, instead of fighting that, you also need to grieve. I find that if I grieved that, I literally cried one time because like, oh my gosh, I'm thinking of myself that bad. Like, and I started crying about it. Like, why would I think that bad of my, myself? And I honestly was in my in tears like for a long time then, but it really helped me relieve some of the shame. And you know, so it's it's a complicated question, but I, what I can say it works because you can really you know enjoy sex life after. Uh, you know, if there is something you need to deal you know about the in, like your body image, you know there is some shame associated just like with how you look. I remember I had a very hard time just going to the swimming pool and wearing a swimsuit. Like I would not do that as a teenager at all. And people were laughing at me, why won't I go to the swimming pool? But I just couldn't do that. So, you know, like there, 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 there's just things that you will need to, you know, like know you have some limitation and slowly take small steps. I, I till now don't wear two, two, two piece suit, swimming suit. I can't, I will never wear bikini. I, I'm, I mean, I don't think I have body for it, but I just don't feel comfortable. So certain things like it will just take you a long time. But I think the biggest question here is like, and I think I think that's that's the, the most important part. Uh, you can only ex, you know you can really only uh, enjoy sex life if it's in a really intimate setting, and you can only have true intimacy if you can be honest with your partner and you can only have that if you both are empathetic towards each other. So I think that, you know, this is where I would go first, really, to, to, to create 
an intimate connection, empathetic connection with my partner. And I really hope you are with someone that is a healthy, emotionally available person because you will need you you will need support in that. You will need that. And and you know I think what would also help, I don't know, I love Brenna Brenna Brown. How she Brenna Brown? Yeah, yeah, sorry. Her her, you know, everything that she t- says about shame, because like there's just so much shame, you know, it, like everything that uh I, I forgot how she said it, but basically on the other side of shame is, you know, like you take risk and there is something wonderful. So, you know, if you are in a in an intimate situation with someone who really understands you and you can really, really connect and you have empathy for each other, uh, then you 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 can be brave in that situation. Like you can risk it and you you can, you know, be vulnerable and 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 you know, if you cannot be vulnerable with someone, then there is there is something more at stake that you're just dealing with your issue of you know uh, not liking sex with this person because there's no intimacy over there. So, yeah. and you know, I don't think I, I I don't think I can answer this question fully. I can only tell you that it's possible. I think you gave a lot of great. Um, I think that was a very helpful answer. And. You know, it's going to be different for everybody. So you gave her a lot of things to try and find what works for her. So, oh, so she just said something. So um, if you guys are together, um, you know, some of those things will also take practice. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to say something a little bit bizarre over here. Um, feeling free, you know, in the sexual settings, it's like, Let's say nothing would happen to you and you and you just like a regular healthy person and you are doing it for the first time with the guy. It's not like, bam, you enjoy everything. It's awkward first. So like even if nothing would happen to you, it will be awkward the first few times. So you build that intimacy. You build that connection. You build that freedom. And it's um, just like everything else is like I was... Re- I swear to God, it was just so crazy. I was so socially awkward. I would not be able to have this conversation here, you know, in a book club. I would not put my face here. I would I would not open my mouth. I was not that kind of person, but I practiced. And I had so much fear and shame, but I practiced. So I know this kind of sounds crazy, like are two unrelated things, but they're really not. Everything in life, the more we do it, the more we focus on it, the... the we have a breakthrough and you know so i guess i want to also tell you don't focus on the shame focus on that way out of it on grieving and on intimacy because i think that's what will take you out be brave and focus on building close intimate relationship with this person you had mentioned something before we went live that i again just thought was so insightful you'd made the distinction between Um, kind of separating yourself from the experience. And so this is so common. This is something I think every single person that struggled with abuse goes through is it's, we tend to define ourselves of, yes, I am an abuse survivor and realizing, okay, you know what? I am me Mm -hmm. and I went through abuse. Mm -hmm. And so this situation doesn't need to completely define who I am. There is a self- outside of that. And so what Agatha was saying before we went live was talking about um, ex- rediscovering your sexuality mm-hmm. outside of experiencing sexual abuse. So this is something that happened to you. This is not who you are and your sexuality exists outside of that. And then learning how reconnecting with your body, re- with yourself, and then with, with your partner, um, in a healthy way. And she's so spot on about when, once that, the different levels of intimacy are present with your partner where there is trust and it can't, you can be vulnerable with them, uh, with him in a way where you're saying, these are my concerns. These are my fears. And he's Mm -hmm. handling that well, Mm -hmm. and you're able to work through it. Then it's building that trust and that helps to. to Yeah. And also like you, this is crazy we're doing this book now because you probably have one of those responses like you probably freeze or dissociate yeah 
and that's okay. So grieve it and forgive yourself that, which is, I, when I say forgive yourself that, I, I'm not like, I just don't want you to be angry with yourself that it, it's happening, that you're reacting that way. That's what I'm saying. Like, you're just like, okay, this is how I am right now. And that's okay. And that's okay. And, and I can be with it. You know, I can be with it and I can, you know, just try. And I think the more, you know, the more, um, the more empathetic and the more compassionate, self, self-compassionate you'll be with yourself, the easier it will become. That's what I want to say. Mm-hmm. And so. Jennifer, was she added to this too. She says, yes, I disassociate a lot, not just intimately, but always at work and at home. And, you know, I think one of them, the, the beauty in all of this, and I think this was kind of the core of Pete's book here, was all of these defenses, they're there because they have a message for us. And so if we can explore. So if you were like, okay, wow, you know what, geez, I really, I daydream all the time. I just really live in this fantasy world of, or I live in the future. Yeah. I know what to do. I'm sorry. I know what to do when you dissociate during the sex, during the, 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 the thing, like you, if, if you have a partner that is understanding has your back, you literally tell him once in a while, I stop feeling, I freeze. So and you can you can figure out what works for you to take it out of there. What worked for gosh, I'm so personal here, God. What works for me in the past was I asked my partner to tell me call me by my name. Mm-hmm. And talk to me. Because when I hear the voice, because you know, otherwise I was an emotional flashback of when I was being abused. And when the person spoke to me, I knew I was with him right now, not when I was being abused in the past. So it yeah. goes back into the now. So you basically just need to put yourself out there, be vulnerable, try different things. There is not one right answer. There isn't. There will never will be, I think. But, you know, you just find your way with him and it will be your own discovery. And I think it's going to be great, you know, if you just try and, and listen because you... God, I don't want to say that, like, in a bad way. Like, I like the book, book Pete Walker book right now, but to be honest... I didn't read anything that I, I haven't lived through already. So here, here is what it tells me. We all have that instinct that can take us through the healing, even if we don't have many outside resources. And I, I think that you, you know, you all need to trust yourself. And I don't know, like, I believe in God, that God leads me. So I got, I, I call God leads me, but if you don't want to call it God, just like listen to that instinct in your, in yourself, that God, and you have that wisdom to heal yourself and, you know, experiment, try new things. It's not going to hurt you if you're trying new things in healing, in your commitment to healing. It will probably benefit you. Um, and, you know, and there is no, like, I know you feel ashamed, but there's nothing shameful about any of you. There's nothing shameful about me. There's nothing shameful about Dana, James, Shay, none of you. Jennifer, there's nothing shameful about you. You're just like me. You're just like everyone else. You're just a woman. Something happened to you. and But you are a wonderful, perfect, beautiful, pure person inside of you. Yeah. You didn't deserve it and you didn't cause it. And it's not your fault. It's not your fault. You were not a willing participant in it, regardless of him kind of, quote unquote, giving you a choice. That wasn't a choice because the power oh, dynamic was yeah. un- unequal and it was incredibly manipulative to do that and yeah. um, exploitative. So it not, it's just not you. And I, I wish you, I'll, I hope you keep us up to date with this kind of stuff as you're, as you're going through it. And I hope that Agatha's answer um, helped. Um, I mean, and can I, can sh- if, if you want more, like you can email me and I'll be happy to like answer like any questions that, they shouldn't be answered more publicly. I don't know. Like if that's okay. It's a good idea. Yeah. My email is very simple. It's wholehearted arts. It's one word at gmail.com. And Dana, you can maybe put it in a comment because I-, I use it for that. So Okay. Let me do that. Yeah. Like just send me email and I, I can I I can talk with you about it if you just need someone who went through it. It's arts plural, right? 
arts yes wholehearted arts at gmail.com okay that's what i got okay so on that note we're this is book club and we have been discussing uh the book complex ptsd from surviving to thriving by pete walker it's a great interesting fascinating read you can find my book club notes at thriveafterabuse.com under book club and then book club notes and also just want to remind you guys about audible who sponsors these book club chats we do these the last thursday of every month um at 6 30 p.m eastern standard time you can also find a list of the books that we're going to be reading for the rest of this year over on my website under book club uh, so if you are interested in getting a free audiobook uh, you can go to audibletrial.com slash thrive after abuse and claim your free audiobook when you sign up and the book next month is going to be Whole Again by Jackson McKenzie, who is the author of Psychopath Free, which is another fantastic book. Great book. Yes. Yes. So <laughs> I awesome book. I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> it's great. So I will be curious to, to see what he has to say in that. And I hope that you guys can join us uh, the last Thursday in June, 2019 for that book club discussion. So you guys, thank you so much for for your time, for participating in the chat. James um, has this channel. Agatha has her channel. James, the reviver. Agatha, is it's is it? Um, I don't know. Art? It's probably wholehearted arts. Okay. Okay. I you, the <laughs> Agatha Mikowska. Oh, it's my last yeah, name. That that one. Yeah. Yeah. Who cares? <laughs> yeah. People do. People do. Oh, okay. Subscribe to both. Why not? Just just. Yeah. Do. Shay, do you have a channel? Or are you doing not yet? But yeah, I'm, I'm okay. heading that way. We talked about that earlier, actually. It was well, I only I only add things that you know. I'm a Christian, so I, I and and I'm an artist, so I only put things inside of that. And I don't offer like support for narcissistic abuse. I think Dana does good enough job. James may follow because he's a guy, and we need guys to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm more into yeah. healing people, so I'm. I'm more How can like, people find your art? Oh God, uh, it's it's on my website wholeheartedart.com, and you can also follow me on Instagram, which is the best idea because you can see all the new paintings on the Instagram. So okay. Instagram is wholeheartedarts. Okay. Or on the Facebook is the same. Yeah. So James has one of your paintings. Yes, he does. <laughs> He does. He has my That's prayer, cool. warrior prayer. I yes. just need to hang it up. That's all. James, that was like one of the most serious paintings. I, <laughs> I love that. I love the, the meaning behind that. It's fantastic. Yeah. So, anyway, thank yeah. you so much. Well, for yes. Me. Thank you, you guys. Attention. Thank you. Everyone. And everybody in the community, lots of love to you guys. You are not alone. You are not crazy. And you really can move forward and heal from this. So take care. Have a fantastic week. I will see you Wednesday. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.